Oh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to Winchester University and to the Centre for English Identity and Politics. Uh, this is the first public event of our 2016-17 lecture and seminar series. For those who don't know, the Centre for English Identity and Politics exists to explore the relationship between a growing sense of English awareness and English identity and politics as we normally think about it. Right across Europe, identity politics is transforming the political environment. In the UK, it's been transformed in really just two years. In Scotland, the rise of the SNP nearly led to the breakup of the United Kingdom and may yet do so. In the process, it has almost destroyed the Scottish Parliamentary Labour Party. In England, at the 2015 election, millions of voters publicly expressed concern about what they saw as the possible influence of the SNP on a minority Labour government, and that issue alone may have swung enough votes to deliver the Conservative majority. And in June, a Brexit vote was, in part at least, closely tied up with senses of national identity and national futures. At the centre last year, we held a seminar that examined the impact of English issues at the 2015 election. And those who came to our seminar in February on England and the EU would have been rather less surprised by the referendum result than some people were. That Brexit decision inevitably sets the scene for all our forthcoming lectures and events. Brexit revealed an England that was deeply divided. Divided by values, by life opportunities, by geography, by education, by London and not London, by national identity. And so our focus in the coming 12 months will inevitably ask where does England go next. And the programme that we've organised has two main strands. The first is a diverse England. As I pointed out at my inaugural lecture two years ago, not only will England be 30% visibly non-white in a couple of decades' time, but at present at least, there are clear differences in expressed identity with the BME population much more likely to cleave to Britishness than the white. In the long term, a nation with identity divided by ethnicity is not a happy proposition. Our first speaker, who I'll introduce fully in a moment, will be Trevor Phillips. Later speakers will include Yasmin Alibi-Brown, Tariq Madud of Bristol University, who uh, helped author the Parrock Report 15 years ago, and David Goodhart, who first raised questions about the limits to diversity in a, in a uh, cohesive society 10 years ago. The second theme responds to the sense that was expressed in the referendum campaign that many people feel remote from power in what is one of the most centralised nations in Europe. If that is the case, what are the options for changing the way England is governed? Do current changes in the way the House of Commons work do the trick? What about devolution to English local authorities? Should we have an English Parliament? Judith Blake, the leader of Leeds Council, and Paul Carter, leader of Kent Council, Professor Meg Russell of the Constitution Unit, will speak in a series that opens next month with Eddie Bone of the Campaign for an English Parliament. These are very big and very important issues. And to open the lecture series, we needed a big speaker. And today, that's what we have. Trevor Phillips was born in Islington and spent his childhood between London and Guyana. Like me, he studied chemistry and became president of his students' union, though he went on to become the president of the National Union of Students. He's had a highly successful career in television, journalism, and as a documentary maker, making the groundbreaking documentary on the Windrush and winning three Royal Television Society Awards. His long involvement in the voluntary sector included time chairing the Runnymede Trust. He ran unsuccessfully as deputy to Frank Dobson for Mayor of London and served as a London Assembly member and today he is President of the Partnership Council of John Lewis. As Chair of the Equality and Human Rights Commission, he was not afraid to attract controversy when challenging some 
well-established but perhaps unquestioned assumptions about race, equality and integration. In short, he is the ideal speaker to open our series on a diverse England. Please welcome Trevor Phillips. Well, thank you very much, John. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the invitation to speak to you this evening. It's an immense privilege to kick off this uh, <coughs> distinguished series of lectures. In fact, as frequently happens to me these days, because I'm semi-retired, I, um, I wonder if it, someone's made a terrible error in inviting me to undertake the task. Um, so, John, I'm very grateful for the introduction. You and I have been friends and colleagues for in public life for some four decades. I hope he doesn't mind me saying that. It's a, it's a relief to know that uh, there's at least one person in the room who's not right now nudging his or her neighbour and saying, are you sure we're in the right place? Okay. Big glasses, greying hair, but this bloke does not sound anything like the fellow who used to read the news at ten. <laughs> Or as someone said when I was filming at an uh, anti-immigrant march a few months ago, aren't you Trevor Nelson? Um, <laughs> or bizarrely, I was still being asked uh, in London's Oxford Street last July whether I was Howard from the Halifax ads on TV. <laughs> and they dropped that poor bloke eight years ago. Um, we've got a little way to go in the recognition of diversity, I suppose. All the same, one of the uh, bonuses of being a public figure, even if no one's sure which one you are, is to be able to return to university towns that you may once have visited years ago and to campuses that I might have occupied, not this one, in those distant days of big flares and big hair. In my day, what is now one of the UK's most notable new universities was still King Alfred's College. Uh, much has changed here, but I noticed that the some of the priorities are still the same. At the foot of the announcement for this event, I noted that the all-important words that are guaranteed to boost turnout, I expect half of you are here for that, uh, the cash bar will be open before and after the event. <laughs> of course, uh, today's students are probably a bit more disciplined than in John's and my day. Uh, my own alma mater, Imperial College, required the student union president to show up uh, every, to every departmental dinner and to down a yard of ale, three pints, in the union bar, in one continuous swallow, um, and still be able to walk around the quad unaided. I doubt if anyone in most political parties would regard the ability to sink three pints in less than a minute as an important qualification for the start of a life in politics today. But I suspect that there's at least one political party where it increasingly looks as though this might be the best and only way of deciding who should be the leader. I don't um, intend to say anything disobliging about UKIP tonight, but there are some of my friends who I think still believe that Mr Nigel Farage, who could no doubt manage a yard in his sleep, uh, achieved his historic referendum victory in June by putting the British electorate under the influence for a day. Clever people are still arguing in disbelief about what took place on June 23rd, and many who, like me, were convinced Remainers, simply refused to accept that 52% of the British people made this particular choice whilst in full possession of their faculties. Of course, when Parliament decided to set the referendum process in motion, Few people imagined that this would be the result. But Mr Cameron and our lawmakers are far from the only people to have misjudged the temper of their people, in their voters in recent times. The Hungarian leader, Viktor Orban, assumed that he would win a resounding mandate against proposals by what he calls the liberal elite in Brussels to allocate groups of refugees to EU members. He did win but did not, didn't manage to infuse enough of his citizens to vote to get past the threshold that he himself uh, had set for the vote to be mandatory. Similarly, the Colombian president, Juan Manuel Santos, after four years of negotiations with the FARC guerrillas, unveiled a peace deal to the accompaniment of a choir singing Beethoven's Ode to Joy. 
after half a century of vicious, debilitating war, how could anybody possibly vote against a peace, uh, peace in the subsequent referendum? Well, actually, they did, rejecting the deal by just 0.4 percentage points, 50.2 to 49.8. Uh, and today, every sensible person says confidently, a Donald Trump win couldn't happen. They wouldn't be that mad. That's what I think too, but these are strange times. I've just come back today from Berlin, which a few weeks ago delivered a seismic shock to German politics. For most of our lifetimes, Berlin, which is a state in its own right, has elected centre-left SPD leaders, recently in coalition with Mrs Merkel's CDU. Last month, a stridently anti-Muslim political party, the uh, Alternative uh, for Deutschland, cont um, contested these elections. Few thought that they would make an impact in such a reliably left-leaning city. In the words of the city's mayor, Michael Muller, a vote for the AfD would be seen around the world as a return to the far, of the far right and the Nazis to Germany. In the event, Berliners delivered 14% of their votes to the AfD. Not as many as they'd hoped for, but more than enough to give them, for the first time, seats in a state parliament. The SPD, though it is still the most popular party, fell by 5% to 23% of the vote, and in a disastrous reversal for Merkel, uh, the CDU dropped to 18% and has been forced out of the governing coalition of Germany's capital city. The problem with democracy is that what may seem completely obvious to the folks in charge may not be so clear to the folks who do the voting. Those who call these referendums are a bit like the US Civil War general who, glancing up at the enemy lines, scoffed they couldn't hit an elephant from that distance. Those were his last words. An enemy sniper apparently hadn't got the memo that it wasn't possible and blew his brains out. Of course, the immediate reaction to this kind of shock is always outright denial. Churchill once said that the best argument against democracy was a five-minute conversation with the average voter. It's, uh, this is now a message being repeated in various forms by people bewildered by the outcome of the referendum. Churchill, however, made his remark out of affection and exasperation for the British public. Increasingly, our political classes are turning on the electorate with fury and bitterness. An ocean of ink has already been expended to promote the same message. We could only have voted for Brexit either because we just didn't know what we were doing and bought obvious lies, or that we were so bigoted that we let nothing stand in our way of expressing our hatred of foreigners. In short, we were either fools or knaves. I don't agree. I think the British people are neither racists nor are they dupes, and that those of us who lost need to get over ourselves and try to understand what the people told us. Brexit obviously means Brexit, but I think irrespective of the speed and texture, hard or soft or somewhere in between, of our exit, I think that the British people were sending us a far more profound message. I think they were telling us that we had missed a step in our understanding of what matters to people in a modern, developed society. For most of my lifetime, it's been economics. We all know the phrase, supposedly coined by Harold Wilson, the pound in your pocket. It was updated by Bill Clinton's campaign chief, James Carville, in the 90s as, it's the economy, stupid. Most governments have followed this dictum pretty slavishly, and it's proved moderately successful. 
But globalization has pitched us into a new era. The Remain campaign fought a uh, campaign resolutely focused on the economic prospects of our decision. But I think that the real message of Brexit was that for the British people today, there are things that, are, that matter more than money. You may belong to the class of person who is so well off that an extra 50 quid a month on the grocery bill doesn't matter too much. You will have voted the way you did because you want Britain to be outward facing, liberal minded and internationalist and regarded the prospect of leaving the EU as a surrender to little Englanders. Or you may be the left behind person who can see the fruits of globalization but knows that those opportunities are always going to be seized by someone better qualified or better placed than you are. You may have voted the way you did because you felt that nothing could make things worse and that at least outside the EU you might regain some control over things that matter to you. Either way, for very many Britons, probably the overwhelming majority, this was a vote in which fear of cultural change far outweighed the risks to prosperity. In short, in today's politics, culture trumps economics. <coughs> the challenge of globalization can, according to the former Health Secretary Alan Milburn, now Chair of the Social Mobility and Child Poverty Commission, be summed up in three words, what he calls the three I's. Inequality, identity and integration. And those are the things I want to discuss. <coughs> Today, perhaps Carville's dictum about what matters in politics might be better stated as its identity, dimwit. I am, of course, uh, especially sensitive to issues of identity, partly for reasons that are obvious, but also for reasons that are not so obvious. Let me dwell for a moment on some of the less obvious. Uh, as John said, I was born in London, but circumstances were such that my parents thought it better to send me back as an infant to Guyana, the country that they still called and thought of as home. I'm the tenth of ten children and ten, twelve people in two rooms doesn't quite do the long division of uh, human, of family life. In those days, the capital of, uh, of then British Guyana, Georgetown, was a small garden city with its back to the Atlantic and its face to cane fields, river scape and virgin rainforest that led Walter Raleigh to christen the country, the land, El Dorado. The people were as diverse as you could imagine. We had Europeans, Asians, Arabs, Africans, Native Americans. The only people I don't think I ever encountered as a teenager uh, were Australian Aborigines. It was that way because the British Empire uh, historically functioned as a vast labour market mo machine, moving skills uh, as necessary from here to there. Indian farmers, uh, from uh, Kerala to grow rice on the coast of Guyana, Chinese shopkeepers to provide food and other supplies, for example. My old class lists, class lists in Guyana show names like Ali, Ishmael, Hassad, Chan, Ming, Ten Pal and Singh, as well as conventional European names given to the descendants of slaves, Adams, Harris, Allen, Moore and of course Phillips. But as in so much of the Commonwealth, behind the racial and religious rainbow, there lay a bitter and often violent history of ethnic feuding which still disfigures that small country. One of my own classmates and friends, Donald Rodney, in later years saw his brother, the writer and academic Walter Rodney, author of How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, murdered a bomb in his car, largely for espousing the cause of non-racial politics. So I've seen and lived with firsthand the tantalizing possibilities of great diversity and the, the ghastly consequences 
of an absence of generous toleration of diversity. I understand all too vividly what the reality of ex una multa can mean. It is more than just a phrase. Today the question of identity presents a profound problem for virtually every society in the world. The problem of what Sir Isaiah Berlin called living together graciously. The word for Berlin's idea that we typically use, tolerance, has sadly come to imply a sort of grudging acceptance, uh, coexistence between people who barely know each other and who frankly like it that way. But the original Elizabethan idea of toleration was a much more active proposition, a dynamic conversion, uh, convergence of cultures and traditions to create a new kind of Englishness. I want to come back to this idea of Englishness later. I know, by the way, in case anybody feels the need to remind me about Sir Francis Walsingham's uh, use of torture against Roman Catholics and the cruelty of the police state that he created. But even so, I do think that we can gain much from the idea of toleration without the, th the thumbscrews, of course. I want to argue that solving this problem is more important than it ever has been. And despite the fact that we here in the UK uh, probably do this better, have more to celebrate than almost anywhere else in anyone else in the world, there's still a lot to work out, a lot to do, before we can feel content that we've got it licked. The response of British society now to the social consequences of globalization is as critical to our future prosperity as was our reaction to the decline of empire. And part of our unique challenge in the face of globalization lies in that imperial history. Uh, globalization means that for the past half century we've been increasingly colliding with our own past as those this country previously colonized turned up here in these islands, on the doorstep as it were. And that means that our approach to a multi-ethnic future may not be the same as that of newer nations. The um, famous Caribbean folk poet Louise Bennett predicted as much in the 1950s uh, when she wrote a satire entitled Colonize, uh, Colonization in Reverse, which starts, and I'm going to apologize to anybody in the room who actually can speak Jamaican patois. I come from the other end of the Caribbean. But it goes like this. What a joyful news, Miss Matty. I feel like my heart going boss. Jamaica people colonizing England in reverse. By the hundred, by the thousand, from country and from town, by the shipload, by the plane load, Jamaica is England bound. And then she put the key question in a very special way. What a devil man to England. Them face war and brave the worse. But I'm wondering how them going stand colonizing in reverse. How will England cope with diversity? We're still colliding with our past. But this time we are not the masters of the process. We are, like everyone else in the West, having to negotiate our way through the management of migration that is essential to economic prosperity. It isn't, hasn't been, and will not be a simple process. And just to remind you of the scale of this, today there are 220 million people who work outside their, the country of their birth, sending home some $400 billion each year, more than all the official flows of foreign aid put together. 60% of those 220 million come to prosperous Western countries. We need them, they need us. There is no going back on this. 
So when Bill Clinton famously said that globalization is not a policy, it's a fact, he added that the only issue for progressives is how we respond to it. No point arguing about whether it's, it's going to happen. It's happened. Over the next two generations, the challenge of integrating new and subtle communities as they live together, both in the short and long, as we live together, both in the long and short term, will glow, uh, grow as globalization picks up speed. And it will not only change them, it will change us. Let me return to Alan Milburn's three eyes. I don't intend to spend too much time this evening discussing what we normally call inequality, the gap between groups we identified as wealthy and poor. A lot's been said and written about the growing inequality in Western economies lately, and some make sense to me, a lot of it doesn't. But for children today, the defining political struggles, Second World War, civil rights, defeat of apartheid, are all about equality before the law, eliminating unjust discrimination and the liberation of the oppressed. Even if we don't know where the words come from, the declar this declaration re resonates across the globe. That all men are created equal, that they are endowed by the Creator with certain unalienable rights. The fact that these words were written by a slave owner, Thomas Jefferson, for the benefit largely of other slave owners, hasn't diminished their power. But in modern diverse societies, the preeminence of Jefferson's equality dictum is being challenged. Let me read the words of a modern day prophet. He says, if man is to survive, he will have learned to take a delight in the essential differences between men and between cultures. He will learn that differences in ideas and attitudes are a delight, part of the of life's exciting variety, not something to fear. One stresses equality, one stresses diversity. By the way, I'm quoting, second, from a man called Gene Roddenberry. The more literary amongst you will recognize that name as the creator of Star Trek. Now, before you dismiss his wisdom, let me remind you that this uh, was said back in the 1960s, when, admittedly, women were, to some men, still an alien species. But this was the man who put the first interracial kiss, Kirk and Uhuru, on TV, who pioneered characters whose sexuality was indeterminate, uh, fluid, we would say today, and whose entire work championed a world in which very different peoples could find a way of living together without tyranny. Roddenberry, like many of us, hoped that with the advance of equality, the social divisions based on race, religion, tribe, regional, cultures, even some aspects of gender, would wither away. Equality would make diversity less problematic. Well, it hasn't worked. Differences are growing. Globally, ethnic and religious conflict are more frequent and more damaging. We're facing into some headwinds that are leading to greater and greater fragmentation of our societies, often without our realizing it. So much of what I want to dwell on emphasizes this point. In the UK, we tend to think of issues of identity and integration as cultural and social questions, separate and to some extent subordinate to economic inequality. In my view, this is no longer a tenable viewpoint. Though many of us don't want to admit it, a racial and ethnic cultural fault line runs through our society. The Mapping Integration Project at Policy Exchange has shown that not only does black-white residential segregation in, exist in the UK, it's actually increasing. The Social Integration Commission, backed by research at Oxford, found that even in cosmopolitan London, where we have the widest range of social groupings, we tend not to mix socially with people of other ethnicities. In fact, it's worse in London. Uh, it's measured to be worse in London than anywhere else. In some small communities, you mix with whoever's there, because you have to. In London, you can find anybody that you like who is just like you. Eric Kaufman at uh, Birkbeck University has shown that between 2000 and 2011, 
censuses, some 600,000 white individuals moved out of the capital. Mostly, by the way, for perfectly understandable non-racial reasons, but the effect has been to increase the white-non-white -white separation. Not only are our life chances increasingly dependent on who and what we were born, rather than just our parents' occupations, it's evident that for many of us, irrespective of our wealth, the factors that most deny us our full potential may have nothing to do with our economic standing. We may be more or less deprived of opportunity because of our personal characteristics, a disability, gender, sexual orientation, or our race or religion. For example, when I became chair of the Commission for Racial Equality, it took me a few months, no more, to grasp that the people who feel most cheated in life because of their ethnicity were not, as is frequently said, young black men stopped and searched by the police, or Asian shopkeepers forced to blockade their stores against vandalism. No. These people factor these issues into their lives. The people in whom the sense of injustice burned most fiercely were the people who felt that they had done everything demanded of them by white society, but who were still not accorded the level of respect that they would have uh, been had they been white. I'm talking, for example, about long-standing junior doctors who somehow never make it to consultant. Veteran teachers who never won the prize of department head. Skilled legal advocates who year after year found their application to take silk turned down. And dare I say it, in these quarters, senior lecturers who never became professors. I believe that it is still possible to count the number of British-born minority professors in uh, UK universities on your fingers and toes. And behind all of this, figures mount up. Year by year, we see people trapped by disadvantages which have nothing to do with how much their parents earn or how many, how many assets they own. Today, I can tell you with statistical certainty that an African-Caribbean boy has twice as much chance of seeing the inside of a jail as he has of taking a university degree in, at a Russell Group University. I can tell you that a Muslim man or woman who goes for a job is a third as likely as a non-Muslim to get it. And I can tell you that a gypsy or traveller child has about a one in four chance of passing five good GCSEs and almost none, zero, of getting three A-levels. And even when we think of so-called white working class children, when we examine the failure of this group in detail, we learn some new things. First, the white failures that we talk about today are not in any proper sense the working class. They actually tend to come from backgrounds and areas where fewer and fewer, fewer people actually work because the jobs have gone. Seaside towns, for example, where tourism's collapsed. The problem is more than anything that the sheer habit of work in those communities has disappeared. No one values it, uh, or the, ident the identity that comes with being successfully employed anymore. Second, these are areas where no, no new industries have arrived or show any prospect of arriving. Where there is work, it's too low paid or too unpleasant to attract local people, and even where pay is not the issue, we increasingly see that employers prefer foreign workers for what they would politely call productivity reasons, meaning they can get more or less. Third, we tend to dismiss some of the left-behind whites as nativist bigots. But the, all, the, all the evidence suggests that it's the realization that they and their children can find no reflection of themselves in the story that our society tells about its future that comes before any resentment before foreigners. In short, they divide the world into us and them only after they notice that all too many of the unfortunate us's are the same color, white. All the same, the political and social impact is undoubtedly to further the ethnic and cultural divides. So, all this adds up to that while I recognize the importance of economic inequality, I think that every piece of evidence increasingly reveals that there's a real relationship between the three I's, 
which I spoke, and that income and wealth inequality isn't necessarily one that matters most for most people. But there's another, even more important reason why the bundle of issues that we put together under the heading of identity and immigration uh, and integration may now matter more than our concern about inequality. Our failures are undermining democracy itself. In modern societies, the manner in which governments react to identity issues have become the touchstone for the extent to which they can be trusted, not just on this one issue, immigration, but on all questions. We know, for example, that the scandals unearthed by the Times newspapers in Rotherham and Rochdale would by themselves have been repulsive enough. But the sense in many of those towns, and I've spent quite a lot of time there, that the truth about the grooming and sexual abuse of white children by gangs of mostly Pakistani heritage men, not a sentence you hear very often on the TV, gave the story a twist that turned it from a story of sordid exploitation to one of official cowardice and betrayal. One in which it appeared that the authorities would rather let perpetrators go unpunished rather than risk offending a minority community's leaders. In Germany, something similar took place when weeks after the event, it was finally admitted by the police and uh, mayor in Cologne that the New Year's Eve celebrations had been marred by assaults, mostly committed by North African migrants. The offences themselves would have been outrageous, but the silence of the authorities made this a tale to gladden the heart of every right-wing extremist who could now boast with some justification that only they had been prepared to speak the truth. The silence on these issues has infected politics throughout the Western world and opened the door to divisive, often racist forces, and it's weakened the appeal of conventional politics, increasingly condemned for being shallow, hypocritical, and in denial about the effects of diversity. In what other circumstances could we seriously imagine the emergence of figures like Donald Trump, Marine Le Pen, the only person certain to be in the final runoff of the presidential election in France next year, Kurt Wilders, uh, essentially pulling strings in government behind government in Holland, Viktor Orban in Hungary the Five Star Movement in Italy. People who refuse to engage with the world as it is, who stridently earn us to, urge us to turn our backs on progress, and who essentially are shouting very loudly, stop the world, I want to get off. Dealing with the identity questions that arise from immigration inevitably makes politicians, indeed most conventional public figures, uncomfortable. There's a reason for this, because if we are asking people to join a society and accept its values, we have to tell them what those values are. And you also have to identify what values and behaviours are not native, and, probably, and possibly what sort of behaviours are considered alien. In Germany, if you ask a room full of politicians, journalists and academics the question what constitutes German identity, you're guaranteed one of two things will happen. <coughs> one response is complete silence. No one wants to go there because everybody remembers the last time that question was answered. The other response is that if anyone does answer, they will give you an answer which is constitutional, largely tells you about protections that are written down on paper. The problem is that a bundle of legalese does not help you decide what sort of person you might be if uh, you are to be recognised as German by your friends and neighbours. The French go even further on this formal constitutional road. Being French largely consists of being the possessor of certain rights and responsibilities. Other than these, those laid down by, in the constitution, as a human being, you really don't exist in France. Which is why we get to the extraordinary humiliating spectacle of a woman being forced to strip on a French beach 
so that she can match up to some bizarre standard laid down by the Elysee Palace of how a French woman should dress. In the U USA, the opposite to this constitutional uh, architecture is true. The conception of being American is so weak, and by the way, we talk a lot about hyphenated identities and all of that. Um, I think we get it r wrong. But they, their conception of being American is so weak that when you, you hyphenate your identity, all my hundreds of American relatives, literally I have hundreds, tend to refer to themselves as Caribbean Americans, which means that as long as they salute the flag, uh, they belong to America. But they need have little or nothing in common with their fellow Americans. Indeed, I can, and I will, I'm going there for eight days next uh, or so, next month, I can visit any of my relatives and spend weeks in the company of people of my own colour and background without needing to do more than nod pleasantly at anyone in the street or the subway or a shop who is not Caribbean American. We are completely self-sufficient. Here in Britain, we don't do it that way. We have what I call the Cheshire Cat strategy to deal with our diversity and the discomforts that go with it. Keep smiling, pretend there's nothing going on, and it'll eventually go away. In essence, we work really hard to pretend that all differences are basically invisible, and if they're so egregious that we can't ignore them, we, te we tend to tell each other that they really don't matter because they'll fade with time. I've um, always had a sort of personal test about how far we come as a diverse society, uh, which I call my invisibility test. When I was a child, it was common for people who were not white and male to be next to invisible. Disabled kids carted away to special schools. Boys played football over there, girls skipped rope over there. Nobody talked about homosexuality. Um, my father and I, for example, used to listen to, there may be some of you who are of my age, who will remember Round the Horn on what was then the home service. I swear to you that to his dying day, my dad would have been utterly baffled if you told him that Julian and Sandy, the resident camp couple, were anything other than just a couple of posh white boys. <laughs> Homosexual, what's that? Uh, the racial version of invisibility was odd. It was that we all looked alike. There's a reason why we never figured as real people in white folks' heads. Our, pe our friends' parents were reluctant to let us in their houses. Uh, I could give you many examples, but perhaps the one that stands out in my mind is my sister discovering that she hadn't been dis invited to the 17th birthday party of the girl she thought was her best friend. In truth, we hardly knew each other. We should have moved on, but in reality we're still a society that cheerfully tells the world that we're happily integrated while behaving in exactly the opposite way. Now I'll just give you a, a simple example. Um, a friend of mine who loved Bruce Springsteen, who I didn't know much about, you know, I'm, I'm more of a uh, Mozart, Arvo Parts kind of guy. Anyway, they said, why don't you come to Springsteen concert? So I came along. Wembley, 80,000 people, he played for three and a half hours, fantastic, um, he is brilliant, and goes, but he goes on, you know, for quite a long time. <laughs> um, so we started to amuse ourselves, as you do sometimes, by counting, my friends are white, um, counting the number of people in the stadium, 80,000 people, who were not black, who were not white, sorry. None of us got to ten. The following morning, I didn't, but I could have gone to my church, sat in a room of 300 people, none of them white. Now, there's nothing morally wrong with this arrangement. What is morally wrong is that we tend to pretend that it isn't like this at all. We still have a long way to go in many areas. And by the way, this isn't just about race. Whilst disabled people do have greater visibility and autonomy, the dreadful impact of mental illness in the workplace has still to be
anybody confronted. Far too many lesbian and gay people feel unable to come out at work. But I would argue that it's on race and ethnicity that we still need to make the most progress and that we find most difficult and it is also the ground on which we are most complacent and most divided. Now, what should we do? There are some things we can't control. Interestingly, the thing that pretty much everybody in this room will have uh, interacted with at least once today, the internet, uh, we can't do much about. But Google tells us actually it is fragmenting our society rather than uniting it. We seek out people on the internet who are like ourselves and it ignore others because we can. Our workplaces are no longer typically the vast car and manufacturing enterprises where we are thrown together with others on the night shift from different backgrounds. The integrating role of churches, trades unions and political parties has waned as their influence has faded. Of that group of integrating sites, probably this higher education is the one that remains. And even in higher education, uh, I think careful study will tell us that these institutions are nowhere near as integrated as they ought to be. So what do we do about all of this? Well, I think there's some things that we ought not to do. Sometimes action starts with stopping things happening. Stopping disintegration could start with clamping down on practices that fragment the workplace by race and nationality. I commissioned, when I was still at the, commission, the Equality and Human Rights Commission, uh, an inquiry into the meatpacking industry and it exposed an unexpected and unwelcome finding which may be a sign of our times. During the investigation it became apparent that some companies were segregating their production lines. Employees were quite open about their reasons. They told the investigators that, and I'm quoting from the report here, managers preferred particular nationalities for certain shifts as they regarded these workers as, quote, more reliable or hard-working. Some firms attempted to manage communication challenges or to avoid tensions by segregating shifts so that all workers spoke the same languages, don't have Russians and Ukrainians on the same line. And some supervisors, frankly, refused to have certain nationalities working for them on the grounds of race or colour. I would say totally unacceptable. But I also know totally commonplace. Let's think about schools. Last year, David Goodhart, who will be speaking later in this series, uh, at uh, the Integration Hub, estimated that 60% of minority children start school in classes in England where white British children are in the minority. In London, that figure is closer to 90%. I think that has to change, even if it means imposing a statutory threshold mix. Next, we need to think about what different groups will begin. Uh, the di what, what distinguishes different groups uh, within our society and look positively at what some groups bring. And it, may su it will surprise you that we are so anxious about distinguishing between ethnic and cultural groups, we won't even say what is good about some. One of the biggest uh, battles I had was to put in one of our surveys, it's a very simple thing, data which shows the following. Uh, in 2010 or 11, which is when this was, uh, something like 50% of children got five good GCSEs. South Asian children, that figure was nearer to 65 to 70%. Chinese children, the figure was 90 to 92 percent. And what was most interesting about that group, unlike every single <coughs> other demographic group, is that their household income made no difference to their likelihood of success. The only people who were more successful than poor Chinese boys were Chinese girls. 
So, in my book, that's worthy of study. How, what is it that they do that makes them different? Can we copy it? Can we learn something that will interfere with the long tail of failure in English schools? Well, it took me six months to get anybody to agree that we should be able to publish this on the grounds that it stigmatized non-Chinese children. Absurd. Absurd. We have, right now, the same argument going on about the fact that London schools, a decade ago, were at the bottom of the regional league tables. Today, they are at the top. Simon Burgess, professor at Bristol University, has shown, not causation, but he has shown a correlation, done a regression analysis, which demonstrates that you can attribute the entire effect, the entire improvement, to the change in composition, ethnic composition of London schools. Fewer whites, fewer African Caribbeans, many more South Asians, many more Poles, many more Africans, by the way. So we need to, to be able to look our differences in the face. And fifthly, when it comes to integration, we need to spend what it takes. Germany this year, uh, last year, spent 8 billion euros just in regional funding, never mind what they spent federally, uh, on language tuition, housing, infrastructure to make the million people who came uh, make it possible to absorb them. We need to do things with adult education, particularly giving uh, Asian women the opportunity to learn English, to make them, give them the opportunity to uh, enter the labour market. These are things that government can do. But I want to turn just briefly, um, before I come to my last point, to the role of civil society and the, pri the private sector. Government doesn't have to do everything, and civil society does have some responsibility. I said, for example, earlier that churches don't exercise the influence they once did. That's true. But that doesn't mean they should do nothing. Today, few, relatively few people in the majority community attend worship weekly. According to the ONS, fewer than one in ten white Brits attend a place of worship each week. Contrast that with the enthusiasm of black worshippers, over half of whom are in the pews every Sunday or Saturday. They might be Adventists. Might there not be a role here for the established church, particularly to think harder, about how it brings people of all backgrounds back to its pews in the way that the Roman Catholic Church, incidentally, I am not a Catholic, the uh, Roman Catholic Church has revived itself by a massive infusion of Africans, Filipinos and Poles who worship together. The private sector too could play a part if only by providing countervailing pressures to disintegration. I'd like to take my own industry television as an example. The box is still our nation's campfire. Sensible people are not here tonight, they're watching telly. Uh, TV news is the most consumed of our, uh, and the most trusted way of understanding what is happening in the world around us. It's the vital connective tissue that shares and maintains many of our values. That tissue is wearing alarmingly thin. Depressingly, if you look at the numbers for our most watched news bulletin, the BBC Six O'Clock News, the share amongst minorities is almost half that for all viewers. Minorities are seeing a different picture of the world because they're watching Al Jazeera and other channels to everybody else. Uh, channel 4 News is popular amongst minority viewers, but it's a small channel. There's, uh, we also looked at uh, the most popular 20 programs last year. Um, what is interesting is if you compare the top 20 programs for all viewers with the top 20 programs for minorities, what you discover is that the two lists have only 10 programs in common. What is missing from the minority list? Every popular, what you might call, heritage drama, called Midwife, Poldark, 
uh, Downton Abbey, Broad Church. No appeal. Does any of this matter? Well, it does, for four main reasons. Commercial, creative, political, and social. Uh, commercially, television needs those audiences. Uh, secondly, on-screen representation doesn't matter, and that's a creative imperative. And by the way, uh, there's a justice question here. The people of colour are paying £150 a year for the upkeep of services that clearly don't, uh, don't take them into account. But the most important one here is the fourth reason. It's the most important. What happens at home does not stay at home. The phrase water cooler television was coined to describe the impact of a great show the day after. Everybody is talking about it at the water cooler uh, or over coffee. So imagine what it's like to be in a workplace or a classroom where the, the only person at your water cooler. What everyone else saw last night isn't what you watched. What you saw isn't what they watched. Not only can television tell us a story about our divisions, it can amplify those divisions by excluding whole groups from a shared conversation. That is a most important social imperative. Now, these are all ways that we might begin to tame the beast of disintegration, but it doesn't give us a pluribus unum. Only a national identity, a shared national identity can do that. Uh, so I'd like to turn finally to the role of Englishness in that regard. Now, for those of us who come from outside the is these islands, uh, people of colour, English has, generally speaking, been thought of as an ethnic identity. Minority families tend to say English when what they really mean is white, but they want to be polite. No one actually wants Englishness to be an ethnic identity. It can never bind us together in this new world. But on the other hand, as the German example shows us, uh, a purely civic constitutional identity is just too thin. I'd like to suggest a way forward, and the path to that way forward starts in an odd place with some work we did in Scotland, which I will summarise very briefly like this. We surveyed uh, <coughs> Scottish people, this is my team that does data analytics, before the referendum. There are eight ethnic tribes in Scotland, which include the Scandinavians and the Faroes, the more English people in the borders, and so on and so forth. We predicted that the referendum would not come out as 60-40, as most people thought, but 55-45. Why? Because we identified a specific Scottish tribe. These are people who constitute 10% of the Scottish population. They would describe themselves, if you ask them, as working class Scots from the West. But actually, in their behaviour, they're something quite different. They are historically the most enthusiastic Labour voters anywhere, actually, in the UK. On this occasion, they were expected to vote no. Actually, they turned out to be the most enthusiastic voters for independence. Who am I talking about? I am talking about Scottish descendants of Irish Roman Catholics, 10% of the Scottish population who don't think of themselves in that way, but actually, our hypothesis is, vote Labour because they don't like Tories, and they voted for independence for exactly the same reason. My point here is that what this, this taught us some lessons. One, about the persistence of identity over generations. Secondly, that national identity, and nobody could argue that the Scottish identity, such as it's been promulgated, is not a strong one, but it does not have to be monolithic. Scotland has many tribes. Uh, and also, it is frequently negatively defined. Defined by who or what we are against. So can we learn some lessons for Britain? Why not just rest on Britishness? Well, I think to start like Germanists, it's, it's pretty thin. Britishness. It's a passport and a part-time queen that we share with 16 other nations. Our myths are not that fantastic. Churchill, 
the Spitfire maybe, history for all our pride in it, a little bit negative, defined largely by imperial conquest and dislike of the French and Germans and envy of the Americans. It's not a great 21st century role model. So what about Englishness? Well, I think this is far more promising. Englishness has great deep roots, great myths. Here we are, Alfred, the first and the second Elizabeths, uh, uh, myths in their own way. Not far, not that far uh, from the southwest. Drake, Shakespeare, and the myths about England are brilliant and value laden. What better expresses fairness? anywhere in the world than the myth of Robin Hood. Can't beat it. And it is purely English. Our modern values are embodied in some English institutions. Dare I say, an organisation like John Lewis, employee-owned, democratic, essentially anti-greed, completely loved by Middle England, uh, rich and fertile ground for what it means to be English. And by the way, English identity, which is often thought of as, you know, St. George's Cross, skinheads and all that, is actually pretty capacious. Baltese and chicken tikka masala found their way very easily into being English. It's what the Indians think of it as. And uh, John mentioned um, the work that we had done on Windrush. Windrush is actually a foundation myth. There were several boats. We could have chosen any one of them. We could have said, you know, could have said the Orinoco or something else. But we chose Windrush because it had a story. And uh, I was touched and surprised to see the Windrush appear in the 2012 Olympic opening ceremony. Um, I wish I could say it was my doing, but it wasn't. Actually, this was a myth that got away from its creators because it embodied something that people in this country wanted to say about themselves. It wasn't because we spotted something. It was because people needed it. So I think that we can do something with Englishness. How can we make it work in the popular mind? Well, we've um, tended to... Re uh, to to rely on class-based rules in England, um, which are no longer quite what we need. I think that there are some features that we should think about, and I want to be brief about this. Uh, freedom of speech. Uh, we probably have to have some thoughts about how we are explicit. One of the factors about being English is, a, is, a very, is it really the enemy of creating an English identity. That sounds contradictory, so let me explain... This, this way. We have to have explicit rules of the road for the way we interact with each other if we want to create an identity. And that's especially vital for the newcomer. You know, newcomers, for newcomers to participate fully in society, they have to know what the rules of the society are. But we tend to turn the rules of our society into a kind of cryptic crossword puzzle. Um, we resist being too explicit about what it means to be English, uh, or, being, or to be too prescriptive. I, I was um, a couple of years ago invited to what was described as a small informal supper at a government stately home. It's very nice. Well, in this case, small meant 24 people. Not quite my family's, de family's definition. Informal meant that you got an invitation on a stiff card. And on the card it said, no dress code. Well, this is not a problem if you're a bloke. It just means don't wear a tie. For a woman, it is more complicated. Obviously, no tiara. But pearls, no pearls. Summer frock, business suit. Trousers, skirt. Well, my wife made me ring up some people who'd uh, been before to get a steer on the rules. And in a typical English way, nobody had any guidance at all. In the end, she wore an outfit, which she was very comfortable, and she's a woman of taste and discernment, so it all went well. But the point of the story is it taught me a lesson about our country. When someone says no dress code, what we really mean is that if you don't already know what the code is, are you sure you really belong here? <laughs> <laughs> well, in a modern diverse society, that won't cut it. 
we need rules of the road. And by the way, some of these rules of the road are ones that are very serious. For example, the rule of the road that says we, we treat women as equals in all situations, including, for example, in Sharia councils. I want to <coughs> finish uh, speaking about this by saying the last word about a difficult thing about uh, national identity. Somebody, by the way, needs to write the book about this, you know, maybe a distinguished academic based in a university with a name beginning with W. Um, the problem with most national identities, or indeed, to be more precise, national myths, is that they're forged in the heat of battle, both the positive ones and negative ones. Take the Americans, the War of Independence, the Civil War, the Vietnam completely defining. For us, in my lifetime, it's been the Second World War, but it's a long time ago, long way away. It feels irrelevant to today's world, and a long string of colonial conquests before that can hardly be a template for the 21st century. Maybe we need new enemies, uh, or new old enemies, Russia, France. But is that the way we want to do things? Maybe there are different kinds of enemies that will help to define us. The power and might of the transnationals, perhaps. Or perhaps the leaderless and anarchic forces that have been unleashed in the Middle East might help to define who we really are. It's a question that's too complex for me, and I've already gone on too long. But I want to leave you with this question. As part of defining what an English identity might look like, we will need to say what we're against and who represents that. So who and where is the enemy to be vanquished and in what sort of battle? And that is the next puzzle. Who are England's enemies? If we know that, then we may know who and what England is to become. And I look forward to hearing the answer from here at the centre. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, that was a very uh, profound and deep lecture, uh, as I'm sure you agree, holding a, a really honest mirror up to ourselves, but uh, at the end, pointing to some hopeful ways forward and some of the challenges we face. Um, Trevor's agreed to um, uh, take some questions. I don't know anybody who's uh, waiting to run around the visiting microphone, in which case we might try to do without. Um, but... Uh, can I see anybody who would like to ask a question? We've got some time now. Yes, in the uh, middle there, towards the front. And could you introduce yourself and hopefully perhaps stand uh, and um, make people hear what, so people hear what you have to say? Uh, uh, my name is John Arnold. Uh, my background is as a pol local politician in, in the city of Southampton. Uh, you made the point about the need for rules and uh, understanding. It seems to me it's very late to do that. When the first waves of immigration began, there were unspoken assumptions about how it would work out. And the assumptions were that in two or three generations, the immigration immigrants would have become British through the education system uh, and that was never spelled out those are something that we assume and there was never the deal of what was expected of immigrants and what was expected of the host was never written down uh, so nobody know, knew what was the, what they were expected to do or uh, what they could expect to, to receive. Uh, and we are now two or three generations down the, down the road and we have this kind of situation that you're describing. And I would have thought that there was a particular 
problem with some uh, young Muslims who uh, do not, who are growing up uh, without any uh, particular feeling of uh, involvement or loyalty to the British society. Thank you, John. Can we just leave it at that? Yeah. Okay. Um, I think you, you describe where we were in 1948 or in 1916 properly. The thing about now is that you don't have to refer to any particular group. Everything is different. In the old days, if I can put it that way, uh, we got waves of migration one at a time. And by the way, just to say something about scale, um, net migration running at 300,000, something like that. In the 1950s, uh, when my parents came here and there was alarm about migration, you know what the number they were, wor they were worried about? The gross number was 3,000 a year. So scale, completely different. Secondly, um, the diversity of migrants is very different. 1989, collapse of the Soviet Union, changed all sorts of things. But one of the key things that changed was that instead of you know, migrants coming, West Indians, then Pakistanis, then Kenyan nations, we now have several different kinds of groups um, showing up uh, every year. Next thing that is very different, and it, this, is a, this is a huge difference when it comes to integration, is that when um, Jews came from Central Europe uh, a century ago, there was no going back. There just wasn't. Mentally, everybody was geared to, this was it. Uh, even when my parents came here, I think that most Caribbean people they kidded themselves they'd go back, but actually they realised pretty quickly it wasn't going to happen. Today that isn't the case. Uh, the, there are, whatever it is now, I think half a million, a bit more than that, Poles settled here. But there is a multiple of that number who commute. Uh, if you, for example, even come from the subcontinent, you can go back several times. I think that the, the uh, number of journeys to Pakistan as a population Pakistani heritage population here of uh, whatever it is, a couple of million. Number of journeys to Pakistan, 270,000 a year. <coughs> so the important point about this, coupled with the internet and all that, is that the pull of the past is much stronger for the migrant than it ever was before. So all of these things, I think, make what you, I think, reasonably describe as the deal a very different proposition today than it would have been 30 or 40 years ago. And I don't think we are even at the beginning of thinking about how we manage these things. But you know, it's, a, it's a perfect, it's a correct point. And the question is, there, I'll, I'll bring the microphone up to the side there. Hello, Adrian Owen, I'm, the, um, I'm from Hampshire County Council, legal services practice there. Since we go back about the EU, I mean, has 40 years of being in the EU been beneficial so far as uh, diversity and the sort of growing integration of the UK is concerned? And maybe I'm leading the question there, but if it has been, what does leaving the EU mean for the next 40 years? Um, <laughs> uh, I have to confess, do you know, it's not a question about which I have thought a lot. I, I, I'll tell you one thing, what the, the, the orthodox answer that somebody like me will give is that uh, being a member of the EU has been important um, for extending protections to minorities, legal protections. And I think, I think that's correct. You know, there are uh, elements of our law which Oddly enough, might have been initiated in this country, but would never have been enacted by a British government without some push from within the EU. Um, I would say, by the way, though, that there's, and this is more of a personal thing, 
there are some weaknesses. So, for example, um, there's a big issue that's emerging in uh, race relations, race equality. More and more decisions are being taken by big companies and governments on by automatic, automated processes. One of the things that we know already is that uh, these processes can quite frequently, unwittingly, carry a bias. There's a bank in New York that has just had to pay $30 million, $33 million because essentially its mortgage um, decisions were biased. Nobody's decision, it, nobody wanted to you know, do that deliberately. In fact, nobody had the opportunity because they're all made by computer. We've shown, my, my company has shown recently that it is very likely that um, the car insurance premium decision-making process means that if you live in an area where there are more ethnic minorities, you are very likely to pay an elevated premium. And that could be, the average premium is about £550. The extra could be more than 400, 400 quid on top of that. So there are issues like that we've got to deal with. And unfortunately, one of the reasons we can't deal with that is that the EU will not allow uh, the holding of certain kinds of records because uh, it essentially says privacy is more important than, I'm, I'm telescoping here, equality. So it's one way, you know, it goes one way or another. Uh, the, the, the more wider, the wider cultural thing I would say is that um, I guess if I'm honest, I would say that the be main benefit in the terms that you've put it for us is that we've been able to see just how unbelievably advanced British people are when it comes to race relations. Because if you compare us to France or Germany or even Holland, <coughs> we look like paradise. Any person of colour, if you ask them where they want to live, it's always going to be Britain. Always going to be Britain for those reasons. You know, there might be a job somewhere else that will take you there. But if you had your complete choice, this is the best place in the EU to live. Thanks. Thank you, Joe. The question here on the right. And to just take another question and get the microphone to you. <coughs> the next question will be behind there on the, this on the right. Sir, please. You have um, used a wonderful variety of words, but if I'm not mistaken, two that you did not use perhaps for a reason, were multiculturalism and assimilation. I'm wondering if those two words um, have a problem for you. Yeah. I don't like, I don't like the first one. I don't think it's, uh, I, I don't think it, it's a meaningful strategy for us, uh, or for any country, actually. And I avoid using the word multiculturalism because Frankly, I know that it's a word that uh, will have, there are whatever it is, 70 people in the room, it will have 75 different meanings in this room. I think it's become so degraded uh, as a term, it has become a word that people use simply to describe their favoured description of society. It has no particular descriptive or explanatory power, so I do avoid it. You're correct. Thank you. Next question, please. Um, can I see the next person? The next one will be over here on that side. You, you, you mentioned at the, the end... Introduce that, yourself. Sorry, it's um, Eddie Bowen from the campaign for the uh, uh, campaign for Oh, OK. <laughs> um, you mentioned that um, Englishness needs to define itself against something. Do you think we've come down to the point that Englishness needs to define itself against a British elite or British establishment that is actually quite suppressing a civic English nationalism? Um, for example, suppressing St. George's Day while promoting um, Scotland or Scottishness. Do you think it's now actually come where we've got to define ourselves against a, a British establishment or, um, leaning that way? Um, if I get um, your meaning correctly, you're thinking, is there a sort of modern-day Englishness that uh, feels a bit like what Tyler or you know, Tom Puddle Martyrs or something like that. I think it's unlikely. 
but let, let me put it then more strongly than that. I was really simply observing that if you look at um, uh, national identities, I don't mean nationalisms, but national identities, patterns of behavior, uh, belonging, and so on, they tend to have been fueled by the, um, the need for the particular group to protect, defend themselves against the deprivations of some imperial or invading power. So there are a few things that fuel national identity as strongly as external threat. Um, you, and you kind of see that, you know, you could see that in uh, Italy, to some extent Spain and so on. The problem, I think, for English national identity is that it's really hard to see what that would be in a kind of 19th century notion. And you could make a rather clever debating point to say that our enemy is, you know, like beverage, want, and ignorance, and all that. But actually, that doesn't, in my view, quite cut it. I think the important question is, what is it that, uh, what is the threat that will help us to define the values that we want to protect? What is it that we think is so valuable that we need to club together uh, to make sure it isn't damaged in some way? And I don't think we have an answer to that yet. I certainly don't know what it is. I think it's something that's very much worthy of debate. Um, you know, I, I buy all of the views that say, you know, we need to celebrate and encourage traditions and all those kinds of things. I think that's all part of it. But everything that I have studied tells me that you never really get the way until you've got a way of defining a threat to the values that you think are important. Thank you. Over here on this side, please. And is there one more question after this? I um, think one right at the very back there, please. Thank you very much, Sean. Thanks very much for, for, for your speech. Uh, my name's Andrew Pope. Um, I'm from Southampton. I've been uh, handing out leaflets tonight about the new party that we created last year. Hello, the, English, the, the new party that we created last year, the English Futures Party. Quite a, an interesting coincidence with the title of tonight's uh, 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 lecture. Um, like yourself, Trevor, I've lived in another country, Australia, most of the 1990s, and I quite agree with you with that multiculturalism can probably mean anything you like. Um, it was banded about 20 years ago when I was there in Australia um, as, as, uh, as the solution, and as you mentioned in, early, in your early comments, uh, you mentioned Australian Aborigines and the plight still affecting the communities of Australian Aborigines in Australia is appalling. So, Multiculturalism can mean anything and can mean nothing. Um, you mentioned also, and perhaps where I wouldn't agree with you, is that culture trumps, um, that culture and identity trumps economics. Um, I would invite you to come to Southampton and come to the New Forest and to come to Portsmouth to speak to people on doorsteps, yes, um, and listen to people and what they view as English identity and being English, because you know, the, the idea that England is perhaps uh, being, and being English is by its nature a racist thing to do. Um, I would encourage everyone to come and speak to people in Southampton and to, to help to try to break down like events like this, but to listen to people on their doorsteps to really hear why that it, why, why they see England and, and being English as uh, uh, being a racist thing. So I'd like to ask you. What other ways, other than going out and speaking to people on the doorsteps and in the streets, do you think that we can help break down those, uh, those um, misconceptions of being, in, being English and being from England? Right. Um, if I may, I'm going to take two more questions and then ask you to respond to everything. So the lady at the back there, and there's a question down in front of the middle. Eleanor Bell, um, I'd just like to ask, I used to work, I'm, I'm a linguist by, by background, that's going back a while now, uh, and some time ago I was working with Southampton City Council and John Denhamite 
know the situation. It's going back to the 80s maybe when using that word multiculturalism, some of the officers seem to think that all the council leaflets should be produced in every language of every minority ethnic group in the city. And we used to explain that one, that wasn't possible cost-wise. Two, they wouldn't understand what they said uh, because there's nothing worse than a non-professional or nothing more dangerous sometimes than a non-professional translation. But also, how could you be sure that the uh, group for which they were trying to cater were literate also in their own language? And so it went on, all those questions. But my question for us as a community is, would you agree that when a person comes to, to live and to work or to settle, even temporarily in a country, it's their duty to make at least some effort to learn the language of that country if they haven't already? And I've lived and worked in many countries abroad and made that effort. But also that it's our duty as a community and a country and, as, and a state even to provide the means for that, which of course means... English language tuition, it means valuing our adult ed and all sorts of things that are being decimated at the moment. A two-way process. I remember when David Blunkett said that all immigrants should actually speak English at home. That's a nonsense. But our, maintain their culture, obviously. But in the general world, uh, speak the language, at least attempt to speak the language of the country they're in. And last question. Thank you. Last question. Uh, yes, my question would be really to do with socialism and the fact I can't see how any attempt at an English character can survive unless there is no housing crisis, unless there is, a fa unless there is a, the uh, uh, National Health Service is addressed and improved so that everybody feels part of the same identity. At the moment, you can, be, you can have the best medical treatment in the world if you have the money. In English, to me, that's not part of English identity. There should be an element of fairness, uh, and we don't see it in today's society. Trevor, thank you. Trevor, I, I can invite you to respond and say any yeah. final words. It's just this, the question about the leaflets reminds me of a Southampton local election campaign where the Labour Party's leaflet that was intended to say everybody should be treated fairly if they apply for a job at the Civic Centre in the Punjabi version said everybody will be given a job at the Civic Centre. <laughs> <laughs> I think we did particularly well that year in Southern Mercury. Trevor? Yeah, I... Um, the whole translation business is very tricky. There's the, a the whole branch uh, of uh, study now which is the it's sort of christened cultural quotient because people make terrible, can make terrible mistakes. And um, I hope you will take this in the spirit it's, in which it's meant. Uh, the Honda Jazz is one of the biggest selling cars in the world. It um, was originally called the Honda Fitter. And everybody thought it was fantastic. We were gonna sell it to, they were going to sell it across the world. Um, and it did very well in the Far East. did quite pretty well in America. Bombed in Europe. And uh, they discovered after they spent a lot of money on marketing, but happily before they actually rolled too many off the production line, that the word fitter in Scandinavian languages refers to a woman's private parts. <laughs> and uh, they, the worst part of it was that the slogan that they used for the Honda fitter was small on the outside, big on the inside. So you can get into some very unpleasant territory here. So um, I think the translation point, I completely agree with everything you said, actually. I, I'm not really a big one for tra translating. I'll tell you what, what I think the real big issue be was, where this flipped into the wrong territory. Where you've had uh, one wave after another, you could possibly just justify it. But if you're a council like I don't know, Barnet in London, where you have 30, 40 different vernaculars of significant numbers, actually, it is just practically not possible. And what you then do is you favour the biggest groups. And that, by the way, was one of my objections to the practice of multiculturalism. It ended up being a sort of racket in which councils 
basically it just did deal with the people who would turn out the biggest groups of folks. So actually, you provide translation for this big group, but you'd ignore this lot. Um, more importantly, I think that every person who comes from an Im immigrant background will say to you that access to any good in this society, education, jobs, so on and so on, lies via learning English. And that actually, you know, there are some people who are conspiracists, I, I don't go this far, but there are people who will essentially say, the translation business is a way of keeping us in our place. So we stay within the ghetto and don't have to come. We don't, and we're not expected to play a part in the main society. The Germans, by the way, are now offering 800 hours free tuition. Every migrant, 800 hours free German tuition. We can do that. Uh, on the question of um, Englishness and, uh, well, look, you know, there, there, there are people of a certain age, I'm of that age, who will identify Englishness with the bad old days of skinheads and rep and all that stuff. And there are some people who do not do much mixing with working class communities who still think that, that it's clever to denigrate people who fly the St. George's flag as proto-racists. I... I'm not, meant, didn't, not mentioning any names. I don't really think, to be frank, that most people in this country really think that anymore. I just don't. I think you see all sorts, all different diverse groups, for example, representing England's sports, um, flying flag. I think it's changed in our consciousness. I don't think that's a, a big issue. I think the bigger question, a uh, bigger puzzle, as an answer to your question, is that we have to try to develop a narrative about what it means to be English. One of the things we can learn from Scotland, I mean, Nicola Sturgeon and Alex Simon didn't win that, uh, didn't win the referendum, but they haven't established the hegemony in Scotland just like that. Um, I will tell you one of the things that, um, as president of John Lewis, I, I talked to some of us people in stores up there, and it was very interesting. I was sitting in a room, not this big, but you know, with about, about 100 of, of our partners. And we, I said to them, do you think that we are tartan enough in Scotland? And it was very interesting. Every single room, uh, every single head in the room shook. We're not. And they explained to me, explained to me this way, that actually the development of Scottishness has taken a long time. That the SNP um, started to infuse everything with the tartan. And it became, you know, it's what Gramsci would have called a long march through the institutions. Actually, they were very patient. They made, they, they gave everything a Scottish explanation, if I can put it that way. There was a story about everything that located it and rooted it in Scotland. And I think that is possible to do. Um, I'm not a, at all embarrassed or ashamed about the fact that nation building uh, has to include a serious amount of myth making and storytelling. Some people will say just straightforward lies. Well, okay, fine. But essentially, nations are built in people's imaginations. They're not built by forts. They're built by belief. And belief in myth, I mentioned Robin Hood, are way, way more powerful than any other way. And on your question, sir, about socialism, well, we can have a conversation about what modern socialism might look like. But what I would say is this, and maybe I'm, I'm betraying um, some of my <coughs> own uh, Maoist roots. I think, actually, that most things that are of value don't arrive given. 
they arrive at a struggle. And I think that the idea of identity never, certainly national identity, never arises except out of some kind of struggle. The revolutionary struggle and so on. So I don't think that, I don't really agree with you that Englishness is never going to mean anything unless you've got these things. I think these things that characterise Englishness will arise out of struggle. So, for example, I, you know, let's, let's be frank about it, I don't believe in a modern society with the technological framework we've got at the moment that nationalisation offers an answer to almost anything. I think common ownership, in the real sense of the word, mutuality, might offer an answer. But ownership by the state, the worst experience that we've had for working people. So I don't want to get into it, but I think that... No, I agree. I, I think that the point about socialism, in which, by the way, I still believe, uh, is a, an identity, is that we will forge socialism and identity out of a struggle for what is best for people in our society. Uh, and at some point, we'll discover it. I mean, you know... No, no, I'm, I'm with you. Yeah, but, you know, the, the, answers, the answers will... I, I sound like a terrible old man, don't I? The answers will come with struggle, and that's, that's part of the fun of it. <laughs> Trevor, thank you, very, thank you very much indeed. The, 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 the debates, the discussions that we, we have at the centre are designed to be at the cutting edge of the issues, not places where you turn up and hear something that you half expected anyway. I doubt that there's anybody in the audience tonight who hasn't been challenged stimulated, maybe disconcerted, looked at issues a different way. And that's a measure of, I think, the lecture and the answers that you've given us, Trevor. So thank you very much indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. The next event, details are outside, but Eddie Bowen will be speaking about the case for an English Parliament on the 10th of November here. But could you please uh, thank Trevor in the usual way. Thank you very much. <laughs>